Hey everybody, Dylan Bowman here, one of the founders of Free Trail and the host of the Free Trail podcast. Thank you for watching our video podcast. A couple of things before we get started. Number one, please do join Free Trail Pro, our great community for trail runners from around the world. There's a lot of great perks involved in that membership and we would love to have you on board. Number two, a big thank you to our sponsors here in the video podcast. We don't do real commercial breaks, so I just wanna give them a major shout out on the front end here. We have some discount codes in the show notes that you can take advantage of. Number one, Speedland, of course, the makers of the GS Tam, the shoe that bears the Free Trail logo on it and a product that we worked on to bring to market in the spring of 2023. Our other annual partner is Gnarly Nutrition, makers of fantastic training and racing nutritional supplements that will really help you on your trail journey. We always have a third partner on the show that rotates throughout the year. So depending on who it is now, you can find a link and a discount code in the show notes for that partner as well. But a big thank you to the sponsors who do make our podcast possible. Number three, last but not least, we would really appreciate it while you're here to smash the subscribe button on the free trail YouTube channel. You can also click the bell icon to get notifications whenever we post new content. We are working very hard to keep you inspired, informed, and entertained here in the great sport of trail running. Thank you so much. Enjoy the show. Eli Hemming, welcome to the podcast, buddy. Nice to see you. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Where are you, dude? Are you in Boulder or Kremlin? And like, where's where's home for you now? It's kind of hard to discover uh, on your uh, social media feeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we uh, moved up to Kremlin, uh, which is uh, my wife's, uh, where she grew up. Um, Boulder was getting a little bit too busy for us, um, and we kind of got the opportunity. Uh, so we're living in uh, Kremlin, Colorado right now. Tell the which people is not about, a big place. Yeah, tell the people about Kremlin because that is like way off the beaten path, and it's not <laughs> the sporting mecca that Boulder, Colorado is. Right. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's a, a small town in the mountains of Colorado. Um, so many people have driven through and uh, completely missed it. Um, because, uh, you have to drive through if you're trying to get up to steamboat. So if you've driven to steamboat, you've probably driven through the town. And so like, but what's the vibe like there? I mean, how, what's the population in Kremlin and, and how does it fit your guys' personality and your lifestyle? Cause it's not like you have like the dearth of training partners that you probably did in, in Boulder. This <laughs> point, huh? No, we kind of joke that there's, uh, there's about three trail runners in Grand County. Um, and that's like the entire county itself, not just the town. Um, <laughs> the town population is about 1500 people, um, mostly built up of ranchers and, uh, some cowboys. Um, and so that's actually what we're, uh, what we're living on. We're living on, uh, Tabor's grandparents, uh, ranch. Uh, so this is why I'm technically a cowboy. Technically a cowboy. Awesome. <laughs> technically. It's, it's all on technicality there. Heck yeah. Well, dude, I'm super happy, super excited to have you on the podcast. Finally, I've been closely following this sort of like rocket ship trajectory you've been on as a trail runner since your retirement from triathlon. And I want to just kind of talk through everything that you've been up to and especially focus on this season where you're off to a great start and where you have big goals still out in front of you. But before we get to it in uh, an effort to introduce you a little bit more to the free trail audience. I'm going to ask you my uniform opening question. And that is just what makes you, you, what makes Eli Hemming the person that he is? Uh, what makes Eli, Eli, um, <laughs> tough question. Uh, so I think that kind of, uh, goes back to past experiences, uh, the people I surround myself with, but I think if we go a little bit deeper, it's kind of, what motivates me to be me. Um, and I think that's kind of what I do is, especially recently is I'm trying to find the happiest life possible. Um, and that's kind of, I've found like my wife, I've found, uh, where we're living and it's all kind of goes back to, I'm trying to have the happiest life possible. And like, we'll talk about triathlon like that. <laughs> it goes all into the same thing where I'm trying to find the happiest life. Uh, and it was a good life that I was living, but, uh, just trying to find a happier one here. Yeah. Iterate towards happiness. That's a absolutely good, good way to live. So I guess let's dive straight into it. Of course, you f sort of famously at this point come from a professional triathlon background. I think you told me or I heard somewhere else that 
like your parents were also involved in triathlon, not only in your career, but in like building community and clubs in multi-sport. Mm -hmm. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes. So, uh, my mom's been a swim coach longer than I've been alive. Uh, -huh. uh and then she did, uh, triathlons in college. Uh, and then, uh, when we were younger, uh, when I, well, when I was, gosh, I was probably like five or six at the time. Um, she told us basically like, Oh, Hey, if you find one friend that will come in, uh, she said, said this to me and my siblings, uh, I have two siblings. And so if you do that, I will make a triathlon team and we can train for triathlons and you guys can do uh, kids triathlon together. Um, so six of us started the uh, tri team when we were, uh, gosh, that was 2003. So I was seven, eight years old. Wow. So I guess generally maybe tell us a little bit about like the influence in the support system, because I mean, you were like on the Olympic trajectory on the Olympic path, as a triathlete. And that's probably like an all in affair, not only for yourself, but for your family. So maybe tell us a little bit about like that support system and what influence and support your, your parents pro provided for you since you've been an athlete from such a young age. Yeah. Um, honestly, my parents have been the reason I could do it. Uh, triathlon is not a, uh, cheap sport to get into. Um, and so they were not only financially, but they were emotionally supportive and everything. They got me where I needed to go. My mom was my triathlon coach until, uh, I was 19 years old and she said, okay, it's time that you go find some new experiences, like find somebody that can get you to that next level. Cause I wanted to be at that next level. Um, so she not only, uh, was coaching me through that, but she was, uh, the emotional support to be like, okay, I know I'm not, uh, ready to coach you up to this next level. You need to go find somebody who is willing to coach you for that next level. Um, and that went all the way through pretty much as I started my pro professional career. Um, I would spend years away from home. Um, and with my family, that's a odd thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, there were years where I'd spend two weeks, uh, out of the year at home. Um, and they supported me all through that. They supported me, uh, going to online school versus, uh, in, uh, in-person classes just so that I could focus more on sport. Um, so it was really everything. Was that ever tough for you? Because like, obviously going to school in that traditional upbringing provides structure for kids, but sport also provides structure for kids. School also provides like friendships for kids, but sport school and sport both do that, you know, in really powerful mm -hmm. ways. Like having that non-traditional upbringing, was it ever difficult for you as a kid? Um, honestly, well, <laughs> so the first little bit, I was definitely uh, that awkward homeschool kid. Uh, I will fully admit that I was an awkward homeschool kid, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I did, most of my friends were through the swim team, through the triathlon team. Um, and then when I got into high school, I was able to participate in the local high school's uh, sports. Um, so I went to do, do, do cross country and go do, uh, I did a season of track, uh, and swimming. Um, so I did all of those things with lots of people around. And then <laughs> one of my, uh, one of my parents rules for me and my siblings was you can be homeschooled. Um, but your senior year of high school, you have to go at, back to school. So you have to learn how to deal with the structure of actually going to school. <laughs> so I, I went to a year of seen, uh, a senior year of high school as well. Wow. That's so funny, man. So I'd love to talk to you about just like the process of chasing the Olympic dream. Like, can you talk about the pros and cons of that process? Cause I'm sure it's filled with highs and lows. And I'd love to hear you speak about both like the positive and negative realities of being on that Olympic track. Yeah. Well, so I'd like to preface it with, uh, honestly, I didn't, I was never the, uh, the kid with the Olympic dream. It wasn't, that wasn't my motivating factor for all of what I was doing. Um, kind of one of the things that left me from triathlon, uh, was, uh, realizing this and realizing the reason I was doing triathlon was so that I could have the lifestyle of being outside all the time. Oh. Um, I was, uh, and so really the training was the easy part. It was the the stress of the, the racing and the uh, political nature of Olympic sports uh, that kind of goes back to uh, whose butt are you kissing here? And uh, what did you say over here? 
that's sort of what I was getting at is like, yeah, it, obviously like talent usually wins out at the end of the day, sort of the mm-hmm. cream rises to the top. But oftentimes when you are on that Olympic track, there is the sort of political part of it too, that influences who makes the team because sometimes it does come down to sort of selection, especially in triathlon, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, there is a very long convoluted way of, uh, qualifying for the Olympics and triathlon. And, uh, pretty much everyone is confused by it, including the people that are, uh, making it. So <laughs> I think they do that, uh, a little bit on purpose so that there is a little bit of discretion when it comes to it. Yeah. It's funny because like, you often hear this conversation and it sort of comes and goes ebbs and flows with the Olympic cycle, but trail running fans are often like, Oh, we need to get trail running into the Olympics. And I've always felt like kind of conflicted about it. Right. Like I love our sport as it exists now. And I feel like potentially it could get corrupted by some of those political influences. If it did Mm -hmm. go underneath the IOC and the U S Olympic committee, do you have any comments about that? Any, uh, like, have you commiserated with Sophia Lockley about this type of stuff? Who is a, a winter Olympian and Nordic skiing? Uh, we haven't talked too much about it, but uh, it skiing's, uh, I think, even more discretionary than uh, triathlon is. So I'm sure she has some stories. Um, but yeah, no, I <laughs> currently I'm really enjoying that tra- uh, trail running is not an Olympic sport. Yeah. I'll just say that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So maybe quickly before we move off the whole triathlon thing and start talking more about trail for those who don't know maybe explain the difference between the type of triathlon that you were doing sort of the itu type racing versus ironman because Mm -hmm. it's i think kind of relevant to the rest of our conversation because itu is sort of like the sub ultra distance type racing within triathlon obviously ironman is more well known to the general sporting audience so maybe draw that contrast so people know yeah. So, uh, the style of racing that I was doing was, uh, the Olympic style of racing. Um, so it was a maximum of two hours on a really, really slow course. Um, and so you had, uh, the Olympic distance, which was it's, uh, 1500 meter swim, 40 K bike and 10 K run. Um, and then also you have a sprint distance, which is half of that. And then they also just brought in a mixed team relay, which is just a for people doing really short triathlons back to back to back. Um, but yes, it is exactly that. It is the sub ultra version of, uh, of triathlon full gas and hang on type race. Yes, exactly. That's and it's, uh, the bike is a, yeah, the bat, the bike is a draft legal, um, which is one of the big changes of it. Uh, so you're not, uh, it's not a time trial. It's you get to, sit in a pack and it becomes a lot more, uh, tactic, yeah. tactic involved. And just for, you know, the trail running audience who are going to be speaking to kind of directly here. I don't know. I mean, like, it's so exciting to that ITU style of racing, you know, the difference mm-hmm. of watching Ironman Kona live stream versus watching an ITU world cup race. It's like obviously a shorter viewing experience, but also like in a lot of ways, a more entertaining viewing experience in the same way that mm-hmm. these golden trail world series races that you're racing. in now, as you compare it to, you know, like a UTMB live stream or one of these, like, you know, 20 plus hour broadcast experiences, I don't know. The short course racing is like super exciting. And I just thought that it was maybe interesting given your triathlon background and where you're at least focusing your attention at this point in your trail running mm-hmm. career. So to bring things sort of full circle, just kind of explain the kind of retirement process. Like how did you decide to move away from triathlon racing and, and focusing your energy on trail running? where did that discovery come from? Yeah. Um, so kind of the biggest thing where that came down to, like I was saying, my motivation, uh, behind it, uh, is I wasn't getting the most fulfillment out of everything with triathlon. I love being outside. I love, uh, exercising all the time. Um, that's a great time, but to be at that point that I wanted to be, I was unable to do anything else in my life. Uh, triathlon became all encompassing. Um, and, all I was doing was I would wake up, I would eat something, I would train for a while. I would, uh, come back, eat something, go to back to sleep and then do it all over again. Um, and so I was training 30 to 35 hours a week, um, and recovering the rest of it. 
Um, and I just kind of found a lack of fulfillment in the rest of my life. Uh, I, I am somebody that wants sport to be something that I do, not something that I am. So it's kind of, it's something that I found like trail running gives me that option of being okay. I can only run so much. I can't run 30 to 35 hours a week. My body is not capable of that. Some people might be, but I am not. Um, and that gives me the opportunity to spend more time with people. It gives me the opportunity to like work on the ranch here. It gives me the opportunity to coach, um, just everything that we do outside of running that I just had no option of doing before. That's really interesting. Was there a sense of grief in walking away just out of curiosity or was it sort of like, this is much more in alignment with pursuing my happiness? Um, you know, it was a scary move. Um, I wouldn't say there was ever any grief. Um, and I think that was really telling when I did officially leave, there was, there was no grief there. Um, it was, I hate to say that was a, it was an easy lifestyle, but it was, uh, it was something that was in my comfort zone and I was, I was good at that. Um, and so it came and I could, I could make a lifestyle. I could make a living doing that. Um, and I know so many people want that in life. And so I, I hate to talk bad about it, but it just wasn't the thing that was really driving me to, to happiness. Um, so, uh, honestly, like just finding trail running, it was, it was a awesome thing that I loved the community. I loved the people. Um, it was something that me and my wife could do together. Um, and that was another one of the driving factors. Awesome. And the results have spoken for themselves. It's so funny. I, I think I asked Heather Jackson, the same question of just like, has it been hard for you to walk away from her obviously very illustrious career and Iron Man and focus on trail running. And she was like, honestly, no, <laughs> like, I love this. This is so fun for me. And it, I don't know, I, I think, you know, it speaks for you know, to what every trail runner knows in their heart and that this is the best sport ever. So even though triathlon is awesome, I've never done a triathlon. I still follow it like super closely. I watch Kona every year. I watch a bunch of the ITU stuff when I can get around to it and follow all the athletes and stuff. And I'm always inspired by the work ethic and the versatility, but also, come on, it's not, the, it's not the Mont Blanc marathon, right? Like you're, you're still <laughs> the, doing- the views are not as good. I will give you that. It, it's just not quite the same. I spent, uh, six years traveling the world yeah. And all I got to see was hotel rooms and streets. Right. And yeah. it's, it's not the same. It's I, I actually get to go outside and see nature now. That's that's so amazing. Even Ironman Kona, you're just like riding your bike on the highway. You know, you're not like up right. on, you're not up on like Mauna Kea, like getting the, yeah. the top vistas. So anyway. And, and the thing people don't realize is when they're in that air position, they're watching that white line on the road. They're not watching the what's around. They're watching that line. Right. Make like, sure they don't, hoping that they don't run into something. Yeah, right. Especially those draft legal races. You're like, just don't get clipped in this pack on <laughs> the, yes. the bike leg. All right. So let's talk about your training a little bit. So you have a bit of like a burner account on Strava. You're not super active on the platform. You only post like when you do a race or you're going after a segment CR. So before we talk about like the X's and O's of your training, I'd love to hear you just kind of like talk about that, like the philosophy behind like what you share and what you don't publicly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I did notice that you found me earlier today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> explain to you how uh, I, <laughs> yeah. Um, Honestly, so I use Strava more so for coaching than I do for uh, for posting myself. Um, I, I kind of post races just to put them out there. Um, so if people want to see what they want to see. Um, but I do a lot of training from home and uh, I don't think people need to see where I live. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, that's really the main reason that we don't post, uh, we, we live with a 87 year old grandma and no one needs to know, uh, where, where our house is and because the doors are not usually locked. <laughs> totally respect that. Definitely. Yeah. Trust me. Um, but overall like training, I, I think we kind of took, uh, a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, I coming from the triathlon background where I was so high volume and everything, um, I've kind of resorted to a lot of, uh, aerobic volume, um, and 
I, I would say last year I kind of took just the the classic trail runner po- approach, um, where it was I was just learned I was trying to learn how to run on trails. I was so bad at running on trails. Like I was a a, a decent runner, but I was not a not a good trail runner. Like you mean um, from a technique perspective? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much that goes into like watching where you're going, watching uh, what other people are doing on trails. Uh, so I instead of actually training that much last year, I spent a lot of time working on technique, working on, uh, the ins and outs, like learning how to fuel as well as I can. I'm still not great at that. Um, (laughs) and, uh, this year, I think we've actually really started to bring in more, uh, more triathlon elements of it. Um, so I still ride my bike quite a bit now. Um, do a decent, uh, quite a bit of training for, uh, the average person. Um, but compared to triathlon, it was still a lot less. Um, I kind of think aerobic volume, uh, just it, aerobic volume. I hate to say it, but more is more to an extent right. <laughs> in, in my mind, which I take for what you will. Yeah. Um, so, so add some color to that, add some detail to it. If you can, some, I mean, the, the mix yeah. of, volume and intensity like you were doing 30 35 hours of training a week when you're a triathlete i'm assuming you're doing less than that now but yes, maybe definitely put some numbers to it if you can if you don't mind um i would say really a top out on running um 10 to 15 hours max um which is a, a good bit mm-hmm. but it's not that much hours speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I'll ride my bike, uh, or hike or anything other aerobic volume. Uh, I'll do that for another about 10 hours a week. So I'll do 20 to 25 hours a week typically. Um, but that's about what I found is my happy point where I'm happy to go train out. Every time I go to train, I'm still excited to go train. It's not that I'm like dragging out the door, uh, cause I think I spent, uh, six years a little bit overtrained, and mm-hmm. I think this is finding that happy medium. Yeah, totally. And I mean, you're still probably drawing from that reservoir of 30, 35 hours a week. And so you could probably Absolutely. get away with doing a little bit less volume and perform almost probably at a better level. So, but to kind of touch on this aerobic volume thing too, I think there's probably a lot of people who would wonder about given the fact that you're competing in these races that really require like super high output, sort of like Mm -hmm. effort, um, you know, type energy expenditure with more aerobic training, like how are you implementing that higher end work? And and maybe what does that look like? Maybe leading up to Mont Blanc Mm -hmm. Marathon as an example. Um, Honestly, I don't do that much high intensity work. Like, almost never touch that VO2, um, unless we're going for some random FKT or something, um, or in a race that, uh, I truly believe in, uh, in training races. Um, I know a lot of people have a hard time with that one, but, uh, I love training races. I think being around people, it'll, it actually gets you, gets you where you need to be. Um, and honestly, throughout the week, um, I I'll, I'll hit threshold a good bit, but, uh, I, I'm not, uh, not going super duper deep into the well anytime. Yeah. So, but are you like doing intervals two or three days a week or is it mostly just like easy work with the um, harder effort when you go for a Strava segment or a training race or something? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll do like two a week. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, at this point, you know, you're still pretty new, but man, you've been kicking ass and it's been so fun to watch if you were to honestly assess like your personal strengths and weaknesses as an athlete, like where would you say you have the most confidence and where do you think you have the most room for improvement? Um, I still say room for improvement is in, uh, technique and skill. Uh, I think, uh, that has a long ways to go watching, uh, just running with the guys that I've been running with. It's on the flats, on the uphills. Uh, I am, right there, if not slightly better. Um, but then as soon as we, uh, go to technical stuff, it's obviously I'm putting out more effort than they are to go through that type of stuff. Especially the Europeans probably, huh? (laughs) That's who I'm racing with right now, man. (laughs) Another thing that 
is interesting that I'd love to hear you talk about because Tabor comes from a much more traditional, like running background, doesn't she? Yeah, things- she was. A- I'd love to Sorry, hear like, if there's things you've picked up from her because of the fact that she has more experience as like a pure runner and has probably had some great coaches and in, in her day, like, are there things that Tabor has kind of taught you about being like more of a specialized running athlete? <laughs> um, she has taught me, uh, the the benefit of mobility um r- running off of a bike you have this like limited range of mobility that you just have these tiny little strides um and so she's been uh helping me with uh actually being injury resilient and what uh and being able to open a stride and use less effort doing so so like going back to, I, I'm just really curious about your training. So I'm sorry if this is boring for you, but I'm, there's a lot of people that like, since you're not on Strava, like, and you're competing at such a high level and you have this unique background, who'd love to hear like how you piece things together and especially how you may use tools like the bike at this point. You said you still mm. do spend time on the bike. And I saw you posted that you and Tabor do sometimes like these longer adventure days where you ride to a trailhead and you hike or whatever peak bag and then ride home. So you're out for a long time, but you know, maybe the majority of that time spent is in the saddle rather than on foot. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear, you know, how that supplements your training too, because like, I think there's a lot to be learned from like how the Europeans do it, you know, who do schemo all off season Mm -hmm. and just like the value of balancing other aerobic work uh that's not running specific and how that applies to like running performance this is also something that i talked to heather jackson about that i was feeling like man this could kind of revolutionize trail training because she's doing this gravel cycling scene too so she spends so much time on the bike and then she's kicking ass on the trails too so anything you want to say there about like how you use the bike do you still do intensity like on the trainer or out on the roads and how does that help you with your run performance yeah so i mean we use the bike uh a lot bikes the current uh current phase that we're in right now um in the the winter uh living up in kremlin we did almost majority of skiing uh so we tried to go for the little bit of a european uh style of training um so all winter we were running maybe uh maybe 30 miles a week um but getting in all this aerobic hours uh me trying to learn how to ski and Tabor laughing at me while I'm learning how to skiing. Um, uh, but as we like, as we're in summer now, um, I don't like how my body feels in, uh, running doubles. Um, Tabor, this feels the same way. Um, so if we have a, a workout in the morning, you know, you have that joint soreness, you have everything. It's just like kind of painful. And if you want to go out for a double, it's like, okay, I can do 35 minutes max, mm-hmm. um, where we'll go hop on the bike and we'll ride for two hours. Mm-hmm. Um, so we supplement a lot that way. Um, not big into running doubles. They happen events. It's like sometimes, but rarely, mm-hmm. um, that's, it's like a, on, on a usual day, we'll, run in the morning, ride in the afternoon, or if we're, uh, wanting to get out and do a big adventure, like you were saying, uh, we enjoy, uh, hopping on the bike with, uh, some shoes and a backpack. Um, and we might not even run when we get there. We might just like hike up to the top. Um, I think that one that was on Instagram, we, we went up, uh, it was like a two hour ride up to, I wouldn't call it really a trailhead. Um, it was just kind of the side of a hill. We stashed our bikes, uh, we didn't even, uh, change into normal shorts. We were doing the triathlon style of walking in bibs. Um, and we just hopped right up, like did a little, uh, hike and climbing over some trees, get up there. Our hike was maybe an hour, but, uh, the majority of the time was riding. And I probably felt good to get off the bike and transition to being a, a hiker without like, you know, having to rush out of transition, knowing that there's like 45 of the best athletes in the world chasing you, like in some IP race. Huh? Yeah. You know, nothing's more terrifying than going out at a 250 K and realizing you got dropped. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Right. Anything else on this training subject before we move on to some of the races you've been up to this year? Because, you know, I think you just probably have a really unique perspective as somebody who's been a really high level athlete since you were really young. And 
who comes in with like this non-traditional training approach. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience who'd, who'd love to hear kind of like what's exciting you about training. Are there sort of tips and tricks or secrets that you have that you think is, have helped accelerate your transition into being such a good trail runner? Um, honestly, like I, I think the majority of our training is done more so because we enjoy training, um, which might mean that we're not, uh, pounding laps at the track four times a week. Um, if we were trying to get really fast, uh, or something like that, um, we do a little bit of specific work before races. Uh, so like we're getting ready for Sears and all, so we're doing a little bit more fast running on the roads. Um, but we do so much aerobic time. That's all zone one, like super chill. Um, like we are chatting away. Um, there's no, uh, pressure being put into those pedals sometimes, or if we're hiking, it's like, uh, we're, we're barely breaking a sweat here. Um, and one of the biggest things, like I'd say the reason that we're seeing as much success early on is intentionality. Like we're spending a lot of time doing it, but when we're practice, when we're training, we're doing it intentionally. Like that's something that I preach with all the athletes that I coach on, like learning how to run downhill. It's, you don't have to go throw yourself down a mountain every other day. If you are, have rolling Hills, just every time you're going downhill, doing it intentionally, like saying, where's the best line, where is, uh, the smoothest way I can run down this without, uh, destroying myself. Or if you're going into the last thing, can I destroy myself on this downhill? Yeah. Before we talk about this season, is there anything you want to say about last year and the success that you had? Cause you were sort of, you and Tabor both were sort of like the kind of breakout stars, I think in this sub ultra distance world, um, at least two of sort of the newer character sort of rookies of the year. Um, at least, you know, from my perspective as somebody who fancies himself a person who follows this very closely, it must've been a pretty, I don't know, like a pretty special year to share together as athletes. Is there anything you want to sort of say about the 2022 season and the position it's put you in now before we start talking about what you've been up to more recently? Yeah. I mean, the 2022 season was, it was amazing. Um, it was something that we honestly had no idea what we were doing. Um, we were having a great time. Like we had great friends telling us, uh, giving us tips on how to do everything. Um, honestly, our race schedule was built by at races. We were asked where we're supposed to go next. Um, and that is not a good one for the bank account, but it was super fun and it was super fulfilling. Like it got us to see just how amazing some of the trail runners are in the world. Um, and we saw like we were watching, uh, all these runners at these European races at, uh, the local races where, and we're just like, okay, this is something that we would like to do. And we want to, we saw what we need to do and we want to get there. Um, so our process just became, let's, let's get to that level as, as well as we can without doing anything dumb. Say <laughs> hey, a little bit more, you don't have to go into specifics, but I think that's kind of an important point where you said, you know, it's not good for the bank account and you guys were unsponsored last year. You've since been mm -hmm. picked up by Solomon. And so you sort of have to make that investment in yourself and in your own career when you don't have a brand to do it for you. And I think mm -hmm. when you bet on yourself in those situations, that's kind of when good things happen. You have that sense of desperation. Like I need to make this work if this is going to be my full-time job and justify the amount of hours I put into it. Talk mm -hmm. about that, that investment you guys made in yourselves and, and sort of, sort of where it's put you now. Yeah. Um, a lot of it. So one of our biggest, biggest investments was, uh, going over to Sears and all, um, we justified it with saying it was our honeymoon. Um, <laughs> nice. it, it, that was, that was purely just, uh, we, we had to tell that to ourselves. Um, but it was, it was really an amazing thing. Um, we, we spent all that, uh, money trying to get to these races. Um, Cause we want, we, we were very curious on how good the rest of the world is at this. And like, if we wanted to do it, we wanted to go full in. Um, and so we were willing just to put in the investment um, and say like, okay, this year is going to be a little bit tight on cash. Um, and honestly, so like Tabor's race at Sears and all last year really got our, our foot in the door. Um, that, that I think not, or ninth yeah. after the, the doping infraction. Yeah. 
at, yeah, after the infraction, she was ninth. Um, and that really got our foot in the door uh, with Golden Trail um, so that they would actually help us fund our way to other races. Um, so that got like, when we were at Pike's peak, they brought us bottles. Um, and she was like, Hey, this is also my husband. Would you bring his bottles as well? Um, and Greg was there like, oh, I guess so. Sure. Um, and then they kind of learned the story and, uh, we had a little bit more success there and there. And, uh, at, uh, Mammoth, it was the same way. It was, uh, just, uh, we were, we were lucky that they were, those two races were in the U S because that qualified us. You mean, for... you mean Flagstaff mammoth is this year, right? Oh yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Flagstaff. Yes. Mammoth is this year. Um, there's so many races. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And that, uh, got us to Flagstaff and then that qualified us for the world champs. Um, and then golden trail, uh, helped us fund our way there. Cause we were in the top 30. Um, and so it was kind of something like we, we just wanted to put our foot in the door and see if we could get there. And if it wasn't going to happen that year, um, we we're going to save up for another big race this year. I, dude, I love it. And I appreciate you talking about that too. Cause I get, you know, I get hit up by sort of the young up and coming athletes quite a bit who are looking and like, Hey, how do you get sponsored? How do you sort of make a career in the sport? And I always say the same thing. It's like, you got to like, at some point kind of bet on yourself and invest in yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you can't wait for a shoe company to come to you and want to pay for your ticket to some European race. Like at some point you break out your own credit card, you give yourself that opportunity. And then, you know, thank goodness Tabor had a good race there at Sears and all. We can maybe come around <laughs> yes. and talking about your performance, but like, you, you get the point. I mean, like, if it weren't for that, you guys may not be in the situation that you're in now, which is like, you're both exactly. crushing it on the international circuit and like have set yourself up to have great long-term careers in the sport. And it's because you gave yourselves that opportunity, not because anybody else did. Anyway, that's my soapbox. Let's talk about your season. So like, just let's start at Broken Arrow. I know you did the breakneck half marathon too. I'm assuming that may be one of those training races that you talked about, but I know Broken Arrow was special for you. You and I kind of talked afterwards and you had this sort of like frustrating pattern of finishing second place or like on the podium, close to the podium. And a lot of these big high profile races and you finally sort of like broke through and took home a really proud and convincing W in the 23 K at Broken Arrow. Can you just like talk about that race in particular? I know, you know, for those who remember or who even didn't watch the live stream you and chad hall were sort of neck and heck at halfway and then you you sort of went for it so so talk about that and whether or not you felt like it was a bit of a a breakthrough to finally you know step to the top step of the podium yeah uh honestly that was that was a huge thing um actually winning a race uh i spent all last year uh i think i got like second place probably like five or six times last year um, and every time the going got tough, it was just not quite there. Um, and everybody, there was always one person who had like the right gear. Like I showed up to Colorado 25 K champs and like, okay, if I beat Joe gray, maybe I'll win. Turns out, no, I got second still beat Joe gray, <laughs> still lost. <laughs> um, no, and it was, it was just kind of one of those things like, uh, that was a, a turning point mentally more than anything. Um, it was okay. I can actually show up to these races and go for the win. And I think it's one of those things I'm okay with, uh, not getting second. If I, uh, go for the win and get fifth instead. Right. Um, and that's the new mentality this year. Like I'm, I'm going to go for the win on a lot of these races, um, and put myself out there and, kind of get vulnerable with it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to try for my best. And, uh, if that ends up a uh, catastrophic explosion, more, more fun there. I love it, man. I love it. It reminds me to, I did the finish line interviews at Western States and Tyler Green said something similar and Tyler who, you know, has been such a consistent performer over these last several years and who has already finished second at Western States was like, you know what, like I'm going to, my goal for today is to know, walk away knowing that at least I went for it. Right. And so he was up in the mix very early. And traditionally he's kind of a guy who comes from behind and anyway, walked away with his second, second place performance, but in like a very different style. And I think those types of athletes are, are dangerous, right. Who have more than one 
tool in their toolbox and can race in multiple different styles, but also like the bravery to, to know like, Hey, I'm, I'm going for it here today. Like no matter what you end up with a, a proud result. So, you know, Mont Blanc marathon also felt to me like a bit of a breakthrough for you. I know you sort of jumped on a, the flight to Europe that night after uh after broken arrow so uh, before we kind of get to that performance you know Montpellier marathon was your first race this season on the golden trail world series and i figured maybe we'd spend a second just talking about that i'd love to hear you kind of compare the sort of density of competition and then like the the sort of competitive nature camaraderie among the professional ranks to your triathlon days because i think that would be really interesting to hear you t- sort of make that um, comparison for the audience of like racing on the Golden Trail World Series now. How does it feel in comparison to ITU? you? Uh, much more laid back. <laughs> um, no, the the Golden Trail is amazing. Uh, it's funny how how good of friends everyone is in that uh, on that World Series. Um, it seems like everybody's traveling uh, around to these races and getting back to see each other. It's like, Oh dude, let's go for a run. Let's, let's uh, go hang out. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where that doesn't st- stop until you're starting the race. It's, it's still like joking with your friend while you're standing on the start line. Um, and that's, that's something that never really happened in triathlon. It was a bit more, uh, everyone was, there was more nerves on the start line and it was, everybody was like in their own head. It's like, okay, I'm shutting out the world. And, I have to do this, this, and this. Um, I still think the triathlon starts are the most terrifying thing in the world. Um, if you're not big and strong, you are going to get dunked. And, uh, if anybody's seen me, I'm not that big of a guy. Um, and so I was, uh, I was drowned many times in the start of a triathlon. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. in the, the golden Trail world series. Yeah. I don't know. It's like, again, just to draw that comparison, golden trail sort of being the itu of trail running like it's just such exciting racing and i do get the sense that the athletes who are competing on that circuit and i would say that unquestionably at this point the golden trail world series is like where the densest heaviest competition is globally in the sport of trail running but it's great to see like the camaraderie is still shared that trail culture still permeates these super high octane, very competitive races where there is a lot on the line for you guys. So I watched the Mont Blanc marathon stream, which was so rad. And you guys were sort of like running in this pack early. And I got the sense that you had sort of like marked Remy Bonet, who went on to eventually win the race. Uh, and you, because there was an early leader, I think he was a Swedish guy. And I just kind of noticed that you were sort of like hanging on Remy's wheel. Was that a correct interpretation? Like, were were you basically marking him as the guy you wanted to stick with? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, okay, totally honestly. Uh, <laughs> even like the guys that saw me, like, okay, like if Remy goes, like, you probably shouldn't. You're probably gonna blow up. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> Um, so it was a little bit of uh, stubbornness, like, okay, watch this. I'm going to try to try to hang on for as long as possible. And he was on a little bit different fitness level than I was. Um, but I think, uh, I'd like to close that gap as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you went for it. So, so talk about that too. Be, like, I'd love to hear where he did break the elastic and now in retrospect, like, is there anything you felt like you could have done better that day or was he just a little bit stronger? Um, so I think a lot of, uh, short answer, he was definitely just stronger. Um, but it was, uh, on that first big climb out of the tour, um, you climb, uh, basically two big climbs. Um, and I, my, uh, my thought about the race was that second climb is where the race happens. Um, and so I did let up, uh, a little bit, uh, mentally it was like, okay, well, I'm not gonna have to push that hard on this first climb and Remy goes. Uh And, uh, so kind of what my thought was like, okay, I'll try to bridge the gap. But at that time he already had like 30 seconds on me. And I was like, okay, this is like the best climber in the world. And we're going straight up a hill. Um, and I, I tried to get up to him, but, uh, pretty much as soon as he's away on a climb, it's so hard to reel him back. Mm -hmm. Um, 
watching him go up a hill is like poetry in motion, honestly. Maybe say a little bit more about Remy. Like I, I'm sure you've probably had a chance to interact with them and compete with them, obviously, a couple of times at this point. Do you? And he like really was, you know, one of if not the most impressive performers in the entire sport of trail running last season, winning the Golden Trail World Series overall comfortably. We should say, mm-hmm. what makes him so special right now? Um, I, I think he's, uh, figured out the, uh, the combination. So he, he is that good in, uh, schema. And I think, uh, it was just kind of finding the skill level, the, uh, training that worked for him, uh, in the running specifically, that's maybe not all just running. Um, cause everyone, everyone can't run that much as like you hear about his ski training and he trains so much <laughs> and he does so much for it. He does all this heinous training. Um, and I just don't think that was possible for him running. Cause I, I think that was a disconnect with that. And I think that's finally clicked. Um, but as a person, like he, it kind of goes back to just trail culture in general. He, he's been su- super nice to me since the beginning, um, last year, uh, racing, uh, when I was not sponsored, didn't have any connection with him. He was still cheering me on. He was still doing, uh, giving me a hug at the finish line of Flagstaff, like just a, an amazing guy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know him super well personally, but I've always got the sense that he's a sweetheart, a great representative for the sport. It's super professional. If you follow him on Instagram, you know, he's like as dedicated as it comes. And now yeah. it's like really turning into one of the great, public representatives of the sport with just like massive talent and also still young with a really long future ahead of him. It's, it's great to see his success so far. Maybe anything else that you've picked up like on this circle circuit as somebody who's probably one of the lesser experienced contenders on the scene, like as you've interacted with some of the Europeans and you're traveling around the world, is there anything you've picked up maybe even from like a lifestyle perspective, but also if there's anything like training or racing tactics related, I'm sure people would love to hear like what it's like competing on this circuit and, and maybe some of the things you've picked up just through observation of how other people's uh, other people conduct their careers. Yeah. Um, honestly, it kind of seems, uh, like so much of it is a love for the outdoors. Um, and, the Europeans in general, it's very much, uh, interacting with the outdoors. Um, it's not just, I'm going to go put my head down on this concrete path and do some hard training. Um, I know that's, uh, so many Americans think that way, like, okay, I'm going to go train so hard and then it's going to be fun at the race. Whereas a lot of the Europeans are having so much fun during the training that they end up training more. Um, and I think, uh, looking at how they train, um, it's a lot of it is that a little bit more of an aerobic hours. And that's why we brought like me and Tabor brought so much of cycling back into our training. Um, as we see these Europeans like going out for these big days and like, okay, I can't go run 30 miles every weekend, but I can ride my bike to that trailhead and I can ride four hours on a day. I can ride, uh, all this extra hours in a week and kind of minimize that gap where I might not be able to run that much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know this was, I think this was your first like European podium at Mont Blanc Marathon. I guess we Mm -hmm. should state explicitly if it wasn't obvious for the listeners, you ended up finishing second to Remy Bonnet, uh, the Swiss machine at the Mont Blanc Marathon. And now I've sort of put yourself in a really great position for the Golden Trail World Series. And we'll start to look ahead towards Sierras and all in a second. But I think for Americans, right, there's typically kind of a learning curve to going over and racing in Europe too. And it usually takes a few tries to figure it out. And I know Sierras and all may have been one of those (laughs) figure it out missions last year, but to come away with a second place finish, even though, you know, we've already talked about how many second places you have in your career, like that must be super, super satisfying for you. Yeah. That, that second place really felt like a win. Um, and that was, that was one of the highlights of the trail career so far. Um, let's hope they keep coming, but, uh, that was definitely a highlight. 
Hell yeah. So let's just touch briefly on Mount Marathon because I think this will be instructive for the audience also. I think just describe the decision-making process to not line up or not make the trip up to Alaska for Mount Marathon. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything you want to say about like calendar construction in general and how you set yourself up for success just in sort of planning out a season. Yeah. Um, well, I'll start with this. Um, I am very easy to get talked into a race. Um, and when a awesome race like Mount Marathon is dangled in front of me, I jump at it. Um, and <laughs> nobody said I wasn't ambitious, but, uh, the, the, a little backstory to that. It, it was broken arrow one week, the next week was Mount Marathon or, uh, Mont Blanc. And then the following week, it was like, eight days. It was cause it was on like a Tuesday. Um, then it was Mount marathon and I would have had to go from California all the way to Chamonix, all the way up to Seward. Um, and the, <laughs> we were all ready to do it. We had all our flights. Uh, it was great idea in our head. Um, and then the day after, uh, <laughs> Mont Blanc, we wake up and we can't walk. It's, <laughs> we, we are, so unbelievably trash. We're like, okay, well, let's go for a hike, try to get some of this gunk out of our legs. Um, go for a little hike, and we are walking backwards down the hill because we hurt so much. Um, and honestly, it just kind of continues that way for the next three days. And we just don't really get feeling better, better. Um, and it kind of got to that point where, okay, I think if we go to Mount Marathon, which is just the most heinous course you've ever seen. I think I might actually hurt myself. Right. I don't think I have like the, uh, the leg fatigue will still be there. And I don't think, uh, it just wasn't right for the end of, or the rest of the season. This is still very early on in our season. That was only, um, Mont Blanc was only a third race of the year. Um, so, uh, looking forward to the following races, we decided to drop out of uh, Mount marathon, which was one of the harder decisions to make, but, uh, we're in this sport for the long haul. We're not in it for, uh, for a year. So that was kind of the thought process behind it. Smart. And it is tough to turn down those types of opportunities and especially Mount marathon, even though it is like a heinous course, like you said, it's a 5k, right? You could have easily talked yourself into running another 5k. <laughs> we should mention too. Taper got, was she eighth at Mont Blanc marathon? Uh, she was, 10th, I believe. 10th at Mont Blanc Marathon. So you guys were both like, you know, coming off these great performances in Chamonix and, and, uh, and Broken Arrow. And so, yeah, may as well be patient and be smart about it. But I think like, you know, the calendar construction question is, is a good one because especially with this sub ultra distance stuff and how it's evolving and all these new opportunities that are presenting themselves. Like you can get a lot of racing in, but you know, that does also kind of put you in a position where you can just take on a little bit too much, especially like with that type of travel too. And so I think it's wise for you guys to have the long-term perspective and I can't wait to see you eventually make it up there to Seward to take on that. <laughs> race because I feel like it does it does suit your skill set just like absolutely red line up the hill and survive um so let's look ahead towards Sierras and all now again you finished 20th there last year so maybe before we talk about goals for this year and how you guys are preparing any learnings from Sierras and all last year with I guess 12 months of perspective now yeah, honestly, it was an eye-opening experience. Um, we showed up, uh, no idea what was going on, but we were like, okay, well, we have raced pretty well in the U.S. And people said this was a, a good course for us because it's pretty quick. Um, and I learned pretty quickly that that day I was uh, I was a mid-pack guy. <laughs> um, and the density of that race is kind of unmatched. It's one of the most competitive trail races in the world. Um, and it's, I, th I think it's very specific. So, uh, a lot of it goes back to, uh, when we were trying to learn how to trail run last year, we gave up a little bit of speed in hopes of learning skills a little bit better. Uh, we were trying to learn skills, techniques, um, and I think our speed a little bit lacked and where Tabor is a little bit more naturally speedy than I am. Um, 
I wouldn't want to race her in a 400. Um, <laughs> uh, I, th- I think that's where, uh, where that tough race came in as I got to the top, uh, in decent position, but then my leg speed, I just saw people go by me the rest of the day. Yeah. And I was actually just talking about this with MK Sullivan and Danny Moreno yesterday and how Sears and all is kind of like a really difficult middle ground between mountain race and fast race. Cause you do have like 7,000 feet of climbing and 19 miles, but it's pretty front loaded. And there are a lot of sort of fast miles, especially in the, the middle and the back half of the race. So you do have to have that mix of like, you know, pure uphill power, but also be able to like move fast on runnable terrain. So probably a difficult mm-hmm. race to train for. So maybe to then ask the natural next question, how have you adjusted your training to kind of get that speed back into your legs without compromising the climbing fitness? Yeah, a lot of, uh, well, um, I would say climbing has come pretty naturally to me. I think it, uh, is partly due to how much I'm on the bike. Um, I think the climbing is a lot of, uh, fitness and strength. And I think, uh, cycling does that for me pretty well. Um, so if I, I find that if I'm on the bike quite a bit, I'm usually climbing pretty well. Um, and then just running in general kind of gets me that last little bit. Um, so kind of focused on doing, uh, faster miles on the, the dirt roads around Kremlin, uh, in focus of, uh, the second half. Cause that's the half I'm more worried about of that race. Say a little bit more about how the bike helps you with climbing. Like, are you, as you think it's about Sierra's and all, like, are you doing mostly lower intensity work on the bike right now? Or are you actually like hitting the gas a little bit sometimes? Uh, mostly just riding, but, uh, it's kind of the, the terrain around here, uh, doesn't let you go easy all the time. Um, it's hilly enough that, uh, you're kind of like constantly under tension when you're riding uphill. And I think that it's, it can be kind of basically like doing a lot of little squats for hours. <laughs> totally. So let's talk about sort of the state of sub ultra distance racing right now, because I, I do feel, and you guys should probably kind of feel grateful for this, that you know, this sort of moment it's, it's how ha- it's having a moment, right? Sub ultra distance racing is really growing in popularity and growing in importance in the sport. When I came into trail running in the U S especially, it was very much like ultra running focus, you know, it's Western mm-hmm. States, Leadville and hard rock, like, Broken Arrow didn't exist at that point. You know, a lot of Americans didn't know about Sears and all and a lot of like the mountain running circuit, which does have a lot of history and significance in Europe. But it seems like it's, uh, you know, a fairly mature ecosystem at this point and that there's a lot of great opportunities for athletes like you and Tabor. So maybe how are you thinking about uh, the sub ultra distance environment as a whole right now? And and what's the experience like to sort of be devoting your career to that element at this point? Yeah, it's been amazing seeing, uh, one of the biggest things, like you say, uh, is in the U S is the growth, um, races like broken arrow. Um, you actually, well, I'll start with, I've, I went over to Europe and had my eye opened on how important sub ultra is to, is to Europe. Um, and it's amazing seeing people out on the course, like every mile of the course, you have all these people cheering for you. Um, and there's, uh, people running with you with cameras. It's amazing. Like you have, you can actually video the whole thing. Um, and then seeing it grow into something like that in the U S is amazing. And like broken arrow, I think is driving that. Um, and I think, uh, I think it can grow into be a bigger thing because it is a little bit more relatable, um, to to the general public, um, you say like to a a normal person, Hey, do you want to watch a Western States live stream with me? They're going to say, how long is it? (laughs) You're watching people run all day. Well, yeah, it's exciting. Okay. Well for the general population, it might not be, but they can sit and watch a two hour race, uh, pretty easily. You just say, but the commentator at the Western States broadcast is so entertaining. He's amazing. He is. (laughs) 
Dude, I totally, I, I totally agree. Like it's such an important thing for the sport. I think what Golden Trail is doing right now, because it's such a compelling viewing experience. And I think does speak to a much broader audience of people who are, you know, endurance oriented or like who would otherwise sign up for a big city half marathon to think like, huh, like maybe I could go do whatever, like the Pikes Peak Ascent or the Broken Arrow VK or like maybe, you know, one of these Cirque Series events or something like that. Mm. Like That's the way we indoctrinate more people into the great sport of trail running and where we can then convert them into lifelong evangelists of trail culture. So thanks for doing your part, buddy. <laughs> <There's no laughs> Thank you for doing your part. <laughs> Just logging through 30 hour hard rocks. Nobody's getting, you know, nobody's having like an inspiring broadcast experience of that. So I was loving watching that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they did do a great job. So anyway, they did shout out to Steve life. Um, and it seems like also like the American sub ultra distance talent right now is deep and dense too. Like besides you and Tabor, like Sophia Lockley's absolutely shredding. Grayson Murphy's another world champion. Allie Max, a world champion. MK Sullivan, Danny Moreno, Anna Gibson, Joe Gray, Andy Wacker. Like there's a deep group of great athletes right now competing. Is there anything you want to say about that just like i don't know going back to your itu days wearing the stars and bars like is there some american pride there on the start line too oh absolutely um i think uh kind of getting the word out there like the more big races that we can have in the u.s um kind of uh the europeans can start respecting it a little bit more and be like okay these these americans can actually race um and i think we uh we have all the talent in the world but uh we just need to get a lot of people in the again indoctrinate them into the trail culture yeah well it's great too like you know sophia is a great example coming as a uh, an olympic nordic skier and now winning mom block marathon i think she's probably in the lead of the golden trail world series at this point and yeah anyway it's just like so many great stories so many great athletes and such an exciting time um especially for american trail running fans so before we sort of start winding down i'd love to hear you talk about like future goals you know like you're still super young and you could really kind of devote your energy to any number of different things in the coming years it's probably difficult to predict exactly how things might evolve but you know, how are you thinking about your career and what are some of the things that are exciting you longer term? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think, uh, I think I would like to stay dabbling in all like the, the short course stuff, but, um, a lot of, a lot of ultras are tempting me. Um, so how I first learned about any trail races, uh, my high school cross country coach, uh, used to take, used to run Leadville every year. And he would have his varsity team come pace him for the back half of it. Um, so pacing the Leadville 100 up and over Hope Pass was, uh, I did that for two years. And that was, uh, that was my intro into, into what trail running could be. And so I definitely need to go run that. That's a, that's a mandatory one. Um, but uh, I think kind of just letting it evolve naturally, see how, uh, see how it goes. Uh, kind of Mount Blanc was one of the longer races I've done, but as well, it was also, I was having fun the whole time. And I think, uh, I kind of wonder if the longer I go, the more fun I have, but I always want to keep that, uh, those shorter races in there. Cause I think those are just, I mean, they're, they're so much fun. It's hilarious running down a hill at just as fast as you can hardly in control um trying to stay upright like that's it's one of the the simple joys in life yeah yeah well it's funny because like i was also thinking about this too and there's there's no reason like obviously you have to be intentional with your calendar construction but you know an athlete of your talent you can mix in both eventually in your career like if you did want to do leadville one day for example like you could easily still throw in <laughs> a bunch of these sub ultra distance races. And one of the athletes I am excited to see perform at UTMB this year is Petter Engdahl, who smashed it at CCC last year. 
and has really been focused, at least from what I can tell, on the shorter distance racing in the early part of the 2023 season. But he's doing UTMB, the big course. And so, mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm going to be really interested. I think, was he third behind you at Mont Blanc? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, he was. So, third place at the Mont Blanc Marathon. And now, looking ahead towards, like, a super tough 100-mile course. Like, if that translates and he proves that he can do it, like, I don't know. That's probably interesting for an athlete like you to observe. Like, maybe I can do both in one season too obviously Killian's had success mm-hmm. doing that but he's a big right. one so. <laughs> right, so I guess before right before we we wind down here so you're doing Sears and all are you going to be doing Mammoth Trail Fest too yep I'll do Pikes and Mammoth okay sweet all right so yeah. Golden Trail season and then assuming you yep. qualify for the final I'm sure that's going to be kind of like the the capstone of your season is that a fair assumption yep and then uh I, I, I kind of want to see if I can find something fun and dumb to do at the end of the year. Um, not really sure what that is, what that looks like, but uh, we're, we're looking for something because don't want to end the season uh, that early. So we're kind of trying to push back the the season till maybe uh, early December and say, uh, all right, then we can stop running and start skiing. Yeah. So to the audience, send Eli some DMs with suggestions of fun and yes. dumb to do at the end of the season fun and dumb things that that, that is what eli wants yeah. well i i took with with tim tollison a couple of days ago i'm going to be doing the broadcast at the mammoth trail fest so and that start list is also completely ridiculous yeah. like that's yes. be one of if not the most competitive races of the entire season up there with sierras and all and utmb etc so Anyway, well, Eli, man, it's so great to get to know you and to have you on the pod. And I just, again, I'm just so impressed with how you've been performing on the circuit. And I think it's really fun to also just like see how you're approaching your training, especially with the background that you have as such a high level athlete in a different sport for such a long time. Before we wind down, a couple closing questions for you. First one. Who is one person that you admire inside or outside of sport can be living or dead? And why is it that you admire that person? Uh, so that's a big question. I'm going to, I'm going to bring it down a little bit and keep it in the sport. Um, honestly, uh, it, an easy one for me is Killian, uh, watching him do, uh, I know it's not something to base yourself off of, uh, the goat, but like seeing like him do say Sears and all straight into UTMB. I think that is something that it, it just, it blows my mind, but it's something that I aspire to do. And I, I love watching him show up to these short races and just crush. And then all of a sudden the next week is at like a hundred miler and like, how is this possible? And I think kind of some of those people are, uh, eye opening and they make you want to strive to be better. Absolutely. The goat KJ, we all admire him. What a guy, not you only cannot, an amazing right? athlete, but you know, a humble father of two, like, come on, so relatable. <laughs> Stop being so good at everything for God's sake. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> so you've been a, you've been like a committed athlete since you're like five or six years old. I think you said, so what is one truth that you've learned about yourself or life in general through that long history of being a high level athlete? You know, I think it's uh finding a love for uh, a love in the mundane. Um, Training is not necessarily, uh, all sexy training. If it is, you're probably not going to last too long. Um, it should be a little boring at times. Um, but finding uh, a love and a passion for knowing what that's going to get you, uh, staying in the the journey of it, not just in the destination say like, okay, today I actually need to run easy. Um, <laughs> it's one of those, uh, things that it's, it can be so boring, but uh, it's, it's fulfilling in that, in that, in itself, really. Dude, I love that answer. Right. You know, embrace the mundane, you know, cause it's like, yeah. there's precious few runs every year where you're just like, oh man, that one felt so good. And then there's like more examples of runs that are just like, shit, like, God, I feel terrible today. And then, you know, like 90% of them are just like totally mundane and average. And it's like, you know, embracing the average in the mundane days. That's, I think, a profound answer to end on here. Well, Eli, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, buddy. Eventually, we got to do this with Tabor, too. So tell her I say what's up. Good luck at Sears and all. And uh, I guess we'll see you in Mammoth.
Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me on. It's uh, it's always an honor. I, I listen to a lot of the podcasts um, and love to love to have uh, the couple on there. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's easier to talk with. Tabor's the talker of the the couple, so uh, yeah. it's a bit easier there. Um, cool. But yes, look forward to ha- look forward to seeing you in Mammoth. Cool, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, man.